Hard. What's up, All right, six period. I'm recording. And we are going to be talking about our notes on page 55. So can you open up your notebooks to page 55? You yes. should already have your basic notes written down on page 55. Yeah. We're going to add to those notes, and we're going to specifically go, and we're going to look at a diagram and spend a lot of time on talking about that diagram. Tomorrow, I'm going to stamp um, page 55 and 56. Okay, 55 and 56. All right, so page 55. It should be right here. Go up to the beginning. Okay, first of all, can you tell me what the equation for photosynthesis is? In, in formula, give me one of the raw materials or reactants. One of the raw materials or reactants, okay? Yes, ma'am? Give me one of them. 6CO2. Okay, 6CO2. Now, let's do this without just reading it out of our notes. Let's do this from memory, okay? So, 6CO2, what is CO2? Carbon. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, okay? Give me another raw material. Water. Water. H2O. H2O. Anything else needed for photosynthesis? Energy. What kind of energy? Sunlight energy. Sunlight energy. Anything else? Sugars. Oh, no. Sugars. We're talking about raw materials or reactants for photosynthesis. A pigment, maybe? Okay, when I say chlorophyll, I hope that it's understood that the chlorophyll is a pigment that's found in which organelle? Chloroplasts, and there are multiple chloroplasts inside of a plant cell. So these things here are all called the reactants of the chemical equation. Another name for them that you're going to see is the raw materials, okay? The building blocks, the things that you have to have so that you can assemble the products. What is produced from photosynthesis? Sugars. Sugars. And can you give me the formula of glucose, sir? Uh, C. C6. H. H12. O6. O6. And anything else produced from photosynthesis? Six o Oxygen, right? I'm so glad the aliens brought you back and you weren't permanently <laughs> abducted. I was worried about you yesterday. <laughs> okay, now I see here there's a six here and a six here. Why were those sixes necessary? To even it out. To even it out. What do you mean? Even what out? Even, even out the formula. Even out the formula. What do you mean by even out the formula? Like to make it equal on each side. Make what equal on each side? How much it intakes. How much of what intakes? How much of the, the carbon plant. dioxide and oxygen and water. Why do we have to have the amount of carbon dioxide, oxygen, water? Why does that have to be equal? Because if it doesn't, Because of it's homeostasis. Because of homeostasis, okay. And why? And because, like, it won't have enough to, like, run through. It won't have enough to run through, okay. So now you're talking about limitation of an equation, limiting equations, okay. Back here, somebody tell me why I have to have that six in front of the CO2. Look at that equation. Why do I have to have the six in front of the CO2? Because isn't it six carbon and no, no, no. I think you might be closer than you think. When we make glucose, how many carbons are in each glucose molecule? How do you know there's six carbons in each glucose molecule? Because there's a six on the bottom. Glucose is six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens, right? Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Well, if I have six carbons necessary to make just one glucose molecule, oh, then I better have six carbons coming into my equation of photosynthesis. Do you see this? 
because you can't make something from nothing. So if I've got an output of six carbons, I'd better have an input of six carbons. Does that make sense? So when we first learned our equation, we didn't have coefficients in front of our numbers. We just talked about CO2 plus H2O gives us glucose plus oxygen, right? We didn't worry about the numbers, but now we put that six there. Because as you mentioned, we want it to be equilibrium. We want things to be equal. What things we're talking about is numbers of atoms. If you have six atoms on your output side, you've got to have six atoms of carbon on your input side. Does that make sense? Yes. You can't, all of a sudden, you only had one come in, but you got six come out. You can't make something from nothing. So I put this six here in front of the CO2. Now when I do that, it gives me six carbons, but how many oxygens do I have now in this? Two. Oh, I have two times six. Oh, 12. 12. But how many oxygens do I have over here? I have six there, and then six times two is 12. 12. So how many total do I have on the right-hand side right now? 12. Oh wait, six times two is 12. And then I had 12 here, and I have 6 here. What's 6 plus 12? 18. Oh, but wait, I only, have, I only have 12 here. What, what can I do to make it be 18 and be equal? A 6. Where? Where do I put the 6? In front of the H2O. Now do my... Oxygen's even out? Yeah, I've got 12 plus 6 more is 18. So now I've got 18 oxygens on the left. And how many oxygens do I have on the right? How many oxygens do I have on the right side? 18. Let's just check our carbons, I mean our hydrogens, and make sure that they're evil. Evil. <laughs> even. <laughs> 6 times 2 hydrogens is 12 hydrogens. And how many hydrogens do I have on the right side of the equation? 12. Was that too messy writing for you and you couldn't understand what was happening? Because the writing was too messy? Do you want to see it one more time without the messy writing? Okay. So here's our equation. H2O plus CO2 gives C6H12O6 plus O2. If I start off and I look at this, I see I've got six carbons here. But how many carbons do I have on this side? Two. two. There's not a two underneath the C. There's a two underneath the O. So how many carbons do I have on the left? Seven. Oh, okay. There's a dividing line here. We're looking at carbons on the right side versus carbons on the left side of the arrow. Okay, we don't add up the two sides. Okay, so on the right side, I've only, got, I've only got six, right? On the left side, how many carbons do I have? One. Do you see that? So how can I make it so that I've got six carbons on the left side? If I put a six in front of the H2O, does that affect my number of carbons at all? No. So where do I have to put the six? In front, the In front of the carbon. So now, how many carbons do I have? Six. I've got six, right? Six times two is... I'm sorry, six times one is six. Six times two, uh-oh, I've messed up my oxygens now. I've got 12 oxygens plus one more. I've got 13 oxygens. Do I have 13 oxygens on the right-hand side? No. no. How, do, how do I make... An even number of oxygens on the right-hand side. What can I add? A six. I can only change coefficients. Now I have 12. Six times two is 12. And, uh-oh. But I got six more. Now I got 18. Hmm. This isn't right. So now, let's see, I got hydrogens. How many hydrogens do I have? I got 12. 
How many hydrogens do I have over here? Two. How can I make that two into 12? Put a six out here. Now this is 12. And when I do that, it's six oxygens plus 12 more. Now I have 18. Is it balanced now? Yeah. Yes. You're going to do a lot of this in chemistry. This is called balancing an equation. I wanted to introduce you to it so that you would see why we have to put these sixes in front of water and carbon dioxide. Okay? What I want you to understand is not how to balance the equation, but why the number has to be there. Why that six has to be there in the first place. This is the equation, the one with the sixes. This is the one that you're going to have to have memorized in symbols and in words. So, where does a tree get its mass? If, if this is the equation, 6CO2 plus 6H2O, Which of those products contributes to the mass of the tree? Glucose. The glucose. So where did the building blocks to make glucose come from? Carbon the carbon dioxide from the air and the, and the water from the soil. That's right. Sorry about the video advertisement. Two Trees are some of the biggest organisms on the planet. But where do they get that matter to grow? It's a nutrient take the grain. It's that soil, isn't it? Yeah. Goodness out of the soil, I suppose. Comes out of the soil. Yeah. Yeah. Goodness. Goodness. Why isn't there a big hole around the tree where it's taken out all the soil? Because it doesn't say gradually that the soil has time to recover. <laughs> now, I think it's intuitive to believe that the tree gets most of its mass from the soil. Because you can see those roots digging into the soil and they must be taking something out of there. And I mean, a tree looks like dirt and it feels solid like dirt. But it's not. In the early 1600s, a scientist named Johann Baptiste van Helmholt tried to figure out where the mass of a tree was coming from. So he got a pot of soil and very carefully measured the amount of soil in there. Then he planted the tree and took care of it for five years, making sure that no soil left or was added to his pot. And at the end of this experiment, he weighed the tree to find that it was 72 kilograms, but the mass of soil had only decreased by about 60 grams. This was pretty strong evidence that the mass of the tree does not come from the soil. I've never thought about that, actually. Because they don't really eat anything. They don't eat me here. No. They don't eat anything. Water is all they eat. So that's all they eat. Yeah. They don't eat anything else. No. That's all they eat. Well, presumably from the water and the nutrients from the soil. Is there anything else that you need besides the soil and the water? It's all they isn't it? To make uh, other, other than the original seed. For that particular tree, the right? sea and the soil and the water and that makes this big tree. Mm. Of course, Johann Baptiste van Helmholt did conclude that the tree was made entirely of water. Now, while that's not correct, at least he was on the right track, realizing that the matter of a tree doesn't come out of the soil. The stitch fix is an online. So, why, in a sense, are you becoming the tree? You're absorbing. The oxygen that the tree is giving off, but that wouldn't mean that would mean the tree is becoming you. Why are you becoming the tree, Chewbacca? Say that again. Because the tree is taking in the carbon dioxide, and they're getting the carbon dioxide from you. The carbon atoms and the oxygen atoms are being used by the tree. Do you guys understand that? Does that make sense? Oops, I minimized what I shouldn't have. Okay, so 90% of the mass of a tree comes from the glucose molecules that it makes that it then turns around and breaks down during cellular respiration. Plants don't make 
oxygen for us. They make it as a waste gas, as a side product of photosynthesis, which then they turn around and actually use. Photosynthesis is all about energy production. The word photosynthesis, if you break it down, SIS means process. Sin means putting together. And photo means light. So the word photosynthesis literally means the process of putting things together using light. Sunlight energy is the energy, the driving force for this process of photosynthesis. What are you putting together? Carbohydrate molecules. Okay, right now you guys shouldn't be worried about doing homework. You should be following along with the lecture, reviewing and adding to your notes. You're not getting ahead on your homework. You're adding to the notes that you already have. If you never wrote this down, if you don't have the notes, then you're taking notes now, okay? But having your notes already done is an advantage to you because you're adding to them right now. So one of these experiments was referred to, Van Helmont's experiment. That's the pictures. Van Helmont, okay, on the left, in the middle, Joseph Priestley, and on the right, Jan Singenhaus. Let's talk about their experiments. Centuries ago, in the 1600s, what was happening in the 1600s? Did the United States exist? No. When did we declare our independence? 1776, okay? So we were just, this is even like before 1692, Columbus sailed the blue. So was it 1692 or 42? 42. 42. Okay, so the Americas hadn't even been discovered yet. Van Helmont decides that he wants to figure out what makes a plant grow. What does a plant need to grow? So he plants an oak sapling, a seedling. He weighs what the seedling weighs. He weighs the amount of soil that he puts in his bucket. And then he keeps track of the weight of all the water that he gives this plant for five years. After five years, he takes it out of the soil, and he's grown a nice, a, a nice little oak tree. And he weighs the soil, and almost exactly the same amount of soil is left over in the bucket. But the tree's gained a whole bunch of mass. And he's like, well, wow, the, the mass of the tree didn't go from the soil into the tree. What had he added? He knew he had added what? Water. So his conclusion was, oh, well, the mass of the tree had to have come from the water. Was he completely wrong? No. no. But was he completely right? No. no. So he concluded that the gain of mass had to be from the water. Because as, as far as he knew it, that was the only thing he had added. But he didn't realize it, that the plant, the tree, the oak sapling, had also used the carbon dioxide in the air. <coughs> And it was the carbon dioxide in the air that was the major contributor to the mass of the plant. Because the sugar in the carbon dioxide, the, I'm sorry, the sugar, the carbons in the sugar, the glucose molecules, those come directly from the carbon dioxide in the air. That's the only place that the plant can get the carbon from. Now, you may say, well, why does a plant have to be in soil? Plants really don't have to be in soil. As long, you can grow plants in a water as long as there's enough nutrients like nitrogen in the water, and that's called hydroponics. You need nitrogen and phosphorus and other things in the soil. Why? Because those other things are necessary for making proteins that the plant needs to survive. Joseph Priestley is actually credited with discovering the element oxygen. How did he do it? He took a candle, put it inside of a glass bell jar, and after a little while, the candle burned out. And he says, huh, that's interesting. The candle needs something. There's something in that jar that I can't see, but there's something that the, the candle must be using up. So he put a mouse in the jar with the candle, and guess what? The candle went out and the mouse died. 
And he says, that's interesting. The candle needs something, but the mouse needs something too. So then he took a plant, put the plant, the candle, and the mouse in the jar. And the candle stayed lit, the mouse stayed alive, and so did the plant. And he thought, huh. And this is how he discovered oxygen. He, in fact, took the gas out of the jar and fed it to himself in a tube and breathed it. And he, it, he found that it made him feel really lightheaded. And that's what happens when you breathe pure oxygen. Because our bodies are not used to getting pure oxygen, so it makes you feel kind of like, woo, a lightheaded feeling. Ingenhouse took Priestley's experiment one step further. He looked at the candle and the plant in the jar, and he said, oh, I know that plants need to be in light, I think. I think plants need light. So he took and he left one in the light and had one in the dark. And guess what? The one that was in the dark, what happened to the candle? The candle went out because the plant could not produce photosynthesis. So he was able to show the third thing that the plants need. They need light, they need something in the air, carbon dioxide, and they need water in order to do photosynthesis. So you put all those experiments together and we come up with the, the rudiments, the, the basic structure of the formula for photosynthesis. Remember, that's all being done without any high-tech equipment. No internet. No biology book to look at for the answers. It's just asking questions and wondering about something and making good observations. You're going to have to use those skills tomorrow when you do your lab. So, do you know what the overall equation for photosynthesis is now? Have we already spent a lot of time reviewing the same equation over and over? Yes. You need to know this equation in words and in symbols. Okay, in words and in symbols. The key idea is, is that this process of photosynthesis is used to convert sunlight energy along with water and carbon dioxide into a sugar. When we say sunlight energy, sunlight energy is not something that we can use. You and I cannot use sunlight energy. We can't use the energy from sunlight. No matter how much we stand out in the sun, I'm just going to get warm and get a sunburn. But I never can make food from it. So we need plants to do this process of photosynthesis where they take sunlight energy and it gets trapped by what? What's the first thing to trap that sunlight energy? What traps sunlight energy? Chlorophyll. chlorophyll. And then chlorophyll gives that sunlight energy to ATP. Now the energy is no longer in the form of sunlight. What form is the energy in in ATP? Energy. What kind of energy? Sunlight. It's not sunlight anymore. Energy. Where do molecules store their energy? The no, where do molecules? Oh. Where do molecules? ATP is a molecule, a group of atoms connected together. Where do molecules store their energy? In the chemical bonds. Ah, in the chemical bonds. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Two days ago, you listened to my lecture and I talked about chemical bond energy. Yeah. And when you break a chemical bond, what happens to the energy? It's released and the cell's going to use it to do some work. So we have to get, we have to make a molecule, we call it ATP, we have to make these ATP molecules that are going to hold on to that chemical bond energy until we need to use it. Do you remember that from the lecture two days ago? Okay. 
So that chemical bond energy, there, there's a, a link there to the photosynthesis wrap. I'll probably play it for you tomorrow. So when we look at a large molecule like glucose, which has six carbons, 12 hydrogens and six oxygens, that is a huge molecule with a lot of chemical bonds. So it must have a lot of energy, energy stored in it. And that's chapter nine, what happens when we break down glucose. Okay, is that helping you to connect some ideas from Tuesday's lecture? Yeah. Understanding chemical bond energy and why we talked about the cycling of ATP to ADP? Yeah. Okay, how do we get the energy out of ATP when we pull off a phosphate? We break a chemical bond when we pull off that phosphate. Do you have this diagram written down in your notes? If you do not have this diagram written down, you're going to write it down right now very quickly. You can put it in your notes. You can add another page on top. Because you should have something different on that left-hand page. If we are on page 55, on page 54, that's where we're going to put our flower foldable. No. So you, you can go to your next right-hand page in your notebook and call that page um, 55 as well and write it there. But we got to get it quickly, quick, quickly done. Okay, so now that you have this diagram written down in your notes or you're just about there, um, we're going to talk about the two parts to the process of photosynthesis. Step number one are called, is called the light independent, I'm sorry, light dependent reactions. This is part number one. Part number two is called the Calvin cycle. So first we're going to talk, talk about part number one. Oh, I got to unfreeze it. Sorry. Thank you. Got to unfreeze my screen. Okay. So step number one or part number one is the light dependent reactions. If I say that this process is dependent upon light, I mean that you have to have sunlight in order for it to occur, right? What else do you have to have in order for the light dependent reaction to happen? Look at what's going in with the arrow. Water, yes, you have to have water. Water is needed. Is that all that's needed though? No. What else? Carbon dioxide. Mm. Is it, does it show carbon dioxide going no. in? No. No. Does it show oxygen going in? No. no. What else does it show going in? Light. light. It's dependent upon light. So you have to have light, you have to have water. And what else do you have to have? What else gets used? Okay. These things right here. ADP and NADP. Now recall that ADP plus a phosphate makes what? ATP. ATP. Right? You remember that from the drawing that you did two nights ago. The oxygen that we breathe comes out of this first step. But is that all that's produced? What else is made? Glucose. Does it say glucose comes out of the light dependent reactions? No. 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 So glucose does not get produced from the light dependent reactions. What else gets produced? Oxygen and ATP and NADPH. Do you see that from this diagram? Now, what did we say two days ago? What did we say ATP's purpose was? It's a what? It's an energy storage molecule. It's an energy storage molecule. Where does ATP store its energy? In the chemical bonds. In its chemical bonds. Do you guys understand that? Those of you who are saying nothing. Do you understand that ATP stores its energy in its chemical bonds? Yes? Okay. 
Where did it get that energy from? It got the energy from the sunlight energy. See, the sunlight energy gets absorbed by the chloroplast, which then stimulates the chlorophyll, which is then transferred to the chemical bonds in the ATP. Didn't we just say this? Yeah. Yes? I'm saying it again because I'm trying to reinforce it in your mind that this first step of photosynthesis, the light dependent reactions are all about harnessing light energy and holding on to it in some kind of molecule. That molecule is ATP. We have to trap the sunlight energy in, into something that the cell can use. The cell can't use the light directly. The light energy cannot be used directly. The cell has to use the light energy and put it into something that it can use. So the sun can't use the photons of light, but the sun can use the chemical bond energy in ATP. Is this making sense? Are you guys paying attention way back over there? I know it's sixth period. Who wants to talk about ATP sixth period? But don't you want to get a good grade on the test? Mm -hmm. NADPH, well, guess what? This hydrogen on the end is just like that last phosphate in ATP. If you pull off the hydrogen, you break a chemical bond. And every time you break a chemical bond, you release what? Energy. Energy. Now, immediately, what do we need that energy for? What happens to the ATP and the NADPH? What happens to it? Where does it go? What does it get used for? I don't know. Look at the diagram. Look at where it's leading into. It goes right into the Calvin cycle. And the Calvin cycle is the second part of photosynthesis. This is an incredibly powerful diagram that if you don't take a minute to look at it and try to understand it, then it's pointless. So what is the ATP needed for? To, store energy. to temporarily store energy and it's going to immediately get used for what? The Calvin cycle. It's the energy for the Calvin cycle. What else besides ATP and NADPH is needed for the Calvin cycle? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide and water. water. Is oxygen needed? Nope. Do you see oxygen over here? No. no. Nope. So Calvin cycle, whatever technically that process is, uses... The things that are produced, the product of the light-dependent reaction, the ATP and the NADPH, along with the carbon dioxide and the water. And what does it spit out? Sugar. Sugar. And? ADP. ADP and the NADP. What? Yes, that's why we call this a cycle. Because it doesn't really have a beginning and an end, right, Frederick? Yeah. It just goes around and around and around like the eyeballs in your head. Like this is, oh my God, so complicated. It gets way more complicated than this. Take AP Bio and you'll learn all about it. Okay. Do you have to have light for the Calvin cycle? In order for the Calvin cycle to run, do you have to have light? In order for part two to happen, do you have to have light? Is light required? For part two, the Calvin cycle? No. It's independent of light. 
the chlorophyll has already done its job. It's already trapped the energy. As long as you've got that ATP on the carbon dioxide and the water, you can do the Calvin cycle. Can you do the light dependent reaction without light? No. 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 This is why plants have to have light. <gasps> Gosh. No, it's, the it's just a stretch, I know. Okay. The last part of this chapter is, you know, can you answer this question now? What's the role of light in chloroplast in chlorophyll? You should be able to answer this question. You know now how plants capture the energy that chlorophyll is in your cell in the plant cells. There's two types. Plants look green because they're actually reflecting that green light back. The other types of light are being absorbed. Okay? And look at this slide. You, this is something I'm sure you guys wrote down. Light is a form of energy. So that any compound that can absorb light absorbs the energy from that light. And that is transferred directly to electrons in the chlorophyll molecule. And from those electrons, it goes to ATP. You guys write this stuff down, but you don't understand. We'll do the quiz tomorrow. Um, don't log off your computers. Go to Google Classroom. <laughs>